And it's my pleasure to introduce from Palestine and Syria, Ahmad Daoud. Um, very good to see you all. Um, as I said to Sean when we came in, you see, no one came. Um, and I can imagine the mood you're in because this is such a film. I watched it this afternoon and uh, I've been able to think about absolutely nothing else. Um, so first of all, I would like <coughs> us collectively to just thank Amir for sharing his life for five years in a way that was astonishing. It reminded me of uh, an award-winning, Oscar-winning Hollywood film actually called Boyhood. I don't know if you've seen it. It had that. And so to share your life, um, can we please thank him and his family? Um, And then, of course, um, Sean for making the most extraordinary uh, film for the same reasons. You know, we live in such a <coughs> short time world. You know, we eat fast food, we think junk thoughts, we have no time for anything. You know, interviews nowadays, if, you're, if you've got 30 seconds or three minutes to say something on television, that's a long time. And here you had somebody who committed a huge chunk of his life to, to become part of the story in a way, which is quite a dangerous thing for a journalist. We're all trained. You must be distant. You must be objective. You must be balanced. All rubbish, really. But this <laughs> is what we're taught. Uh, lies we tell ourselves that we are very objective. But the wonderful honesty of saying, this is a story which is so meaningful to me, I'm part of it, um, uh, was an exceptional um, way of working. So we must thank him, not only for the film, but showing a different way that a journalist can relate to subjects. So can we give him an applause as well? <laughs> I'm just going to ask um, um, the two of them, a few kind of questions, fundamental questions, really, and then open it up um, uh, to you. So you, I'm sure, want to know a lot of things that I want to know. But, but just to begin with, Sean, just tell, tell us how it started. I know you did a little bit in the film, but there was a time before the film. What, what was it that made you want to do this? Um, well, I've been making films in the Arab world for 20 years. I've made films in Iraq under Saddam Hussein and after Saddam Hussein. And I found myself in such... I, I always remember them talking about the golden days when things were before war. And I always felt slightly guilty always just being there when there was a war. And um, I, I'd, uh, Nick Fraser at the BBC had sent me on this crazy film to go to um, Dubai with... Um, to do a film, uh, and it was horrendous. Um, and I previously, I'd met this person that told me about Damascus, and he said, "You know, you got to come. It would be, you know, I've seen your, your Iraq films, but you have to come to see Syria. It's it's like I I Iraq in the golden days." So I thought, "I've got to go and see the golden days of of Damascus," and I kind of fell in love with this place. I mean, the, the w there was this term that they used to talk about: fun with fear. 
and there was fun with fear in those days. And I was hanging out there for maybe on and off in this insane thing, the way that we do making documentaries for about eight months. I think I've taken it to the, uh, a bit of an extreme. But, um, but looking for a story and thinking about, well, what, what, what film do I want to make here? And I was looking at, I was thinking about making a film about a functioning dictatorship because at that time, you know, the left, the left in Britain liked Syria because it was like Cuba. It was putting two fingers up to international capitalism and to America, and it represented something. And that was, but then the other point, the, the danger in making that film was that you were going to make a pro-Assad sort of film. And it was only when I came across AMA, I mean, uh, to be honest, I never found anyone willing to go under the spotlight, which is also a difficulty of filming in dictatorships. And so it what year are we talking about this here? This was 2008, 2009, 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. oh God, it was, yeah. Um, and I met, I, it was only when I bumped into Amma that he could see I was kind of just been sort of taken in by, I think, what it was. It was a, the golden, the, the, the square mile of the old city of Damascus was this very alluring kind of facade. And it's very much what Assad does with his image, apparently sponsored by Saatchi and Saatchi. Um, and uh, once you scratch the surface of any of that, you see that actually it's this most terrible society where people are, you know, I mean, they're incarcerated endlessly. And when I met Amma and his wife was in prison, it was just, I thought, here, here this, this is the story that needs to be really told. And it was also his willingness. Did you really willingness just to meet? How did you meet? Do you remember? We Amma? met in a bar one night and he No. No, really? Just like that? Yeah, I saw this man, he asked everybody in the street, uh, what do you think about freedom? Is Syria is free? And uh, what do you think about this president, Bashar Assad? Why his picture everywhere? Uh, he's crazy to ask this question in Damascus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel it's, uh, it's, it's not normal. And, uh, and he starts to ask me. And I'm worried how I can talk with English man who is like a journalist who wants to ask many questions, dangerous questions. After I... I feel he, he needs something important. At the same time, I need to, to, to send my voice with my family voice outside Syria because we are like, uh, like a mouse in the cage. We cannot move, we cannot do, we cannot. And there is no way to have a journalist to speak with him. And in this time, it's a good chance to speak with journalists. Even I cannot talk with him. Did you trust him? After, yeah. After about two years. After two years. Yeah, and just that's why it took five years to make. It took me two years to get his trust, and then his wife came out of prison, <laughs> and she didn't trust me for another two years. Yeah. <laughs> but the boy did. Bob did. Bob did. Kids are wise, aren't they? Uh -huh. <laughs> now, in terms of, we've all seen the story, and of course, I think the, the, uh, both the reality and the symbolism of a love story, is eternal isn't it it tells you everything almost that you need to know about what is going on in 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 a society uh, and a forbid uh, we often have forbidden love stories you know the ones that are not allowed uh, black and white uh, israeli and palestinian whatever but here was this extraordinary love story um and which told you not only about the couple, but about what can happen to love in these times and in these places. And I was absolutely blown away by this, and I'm sure many people here were, that when love becomes impossible, I don't know if you saw this picture that was taken yesterday in um, one of the camps in Europe where the refugees are all sitting outside, uh, are in tents, and somebody took a picture of a couple kissing did anybody see that? It's in, uh, on the web. They're just in the worst circumstances. It's raining. So many of these people have nothing. And there is a young couple kissing in the tent. And the photographer's just got that. And so there's something very important about this love story. I want to know why you chose that avenue. You could have called it anything. It was the love. <coughs> Well, at different points, it was more of a, a uh, I suppose, more of a uh, current affairs kind of thing. It was, it could, if it was commissioned at the earlier stages, I mean, the reason it's got this large arc is I couldn't get the fucking thing commissioned. I mean, it wasn't that I was like, plan it wasn't a master plan. I just couldn't get it commissioned. Um, and I stuck with it, and eventually we, we did. Um, s uh, and, but 
if it had been commissioned earlier, it would have been an Arab Spring film that would have been a, a largely around the topical events of the time. But what actually started to happen when Ragda came out of prison and then I went out of, and then they, after my imprisonment they were in Lebanon and, uh, and, uh, and all of that craziness. Once we got out of the Arab world and into France there was this feeling that well maybe the film's gone. Actually they're only interesting if they're in the Arab world but actually what started to happen between them for me as a filmmaker was much more interesting in France and it was this fragmentation of and it was this disillusionment and uh, disconnection to this whole place and actually my role became even more uh, connected they, they would call one week he would call me up and say you've got to come uh, now tomorrow we don't know what the fuck's going on you're the only person that's been with us on all of this you can make and then the next week she'd be calling me up saying Sean come now because although these people that have gone through so much talk to so many interesting people that want to help they're looking in the eyes of people that really don't know what they've been yeah. through and I think that's the disassociation and disconnection we have with this tragedy that's on I w in Europe now. These people have gone through so much and they're, they're looking into the eyes of many people that want to help, but uh, they, they, can't, they can't connect because they know that you don't know my backstory. And I'd been b before the Arab Spring with them and had this, um, you know, I don't know what the question was, but... <laughs> no, 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 you've told us very well, but... Um, uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, when you must now see the news in Europe and all these refugees coming from Syria, all these refugees coming from, oh, we, we can't have, and at the same time, here is this amazingly moving story. Yeah, you're safe, you're secure, your children have a future. But as I think, um, I can't remember, one of you said, there's a sort of emptiness can you tell us a bit, if, if, you, if, if it's not too much, yes. <laughs> not uh, too painful? I'm just one example from a Syrian family. And uh, uh, I have association, I did association for two years to help the refugees, Palestinian and Syrian. And I continue to, to help others. And just I, sometime I, I, I feel them completely because I was a, a Syrian refugee, like a family in Beirut. You, you cannot imagine how you, you live without paper, without food, without anybody take care about you. Who are you? It's nothing. You're waiting just one thing, death. <coughs> All the refugees is the same. They have a hope to come to Europe, and they know the European government don't accept. And uh, it, it's uh, true. How you can accept uh, 8 million refugees in Europe? It's not, uh, you cannot believe that. And the, the government never gave a solution for the, the people who want to, to, to stay, to be safe, to survive. Uh, like a zone, a safe zone or something. And, uh, you know they the tried, didn't they? The UN tried, but he never did anything, Assad. They never. say they never, they, they just say. They never the government just say. They, and they promised so much from four years, but uh, nobody moved. In a way, there is, a, there is this interesting um, situation now, isn't there? That, say for example, in this country, there are many Syrian people who have settled over the last 20 years, 25 years. Some of them are Assad supporters, I know some of them. And it's very hard to meet them and talk to them anymore. Okay, um, once upon a time I used to meet them and eat at their houses, but now it's not possible. But So here they are, they're safe, some of them are very rich, and I am shocked by how they don't want to hear about Syrian refugees, particularly revolutionary refugees. I met some of them, and uh, he wanted to translate for me in the cinema. In uh, York. In New York. He's completely with Assad regime. And, uh, you, I don't want you to translate. My language is enough. It's, uh, it's okay. Uh, really, he, he makes me very angry. How you support this murder? How you, you, you imagine uh, your people in Syria? They die every day. The kids in the sea, in, the, in, the, their, in their house, they die. How, how you can support this killer? He's the first killer in the world, I think. Uh, please don't translate. I, I can speak English very well now. 
I so wanted this love of, when you said at one point in the film, when you were still in Syria, I love her. Yeah. I love her from the beginning, after, when I was talking to her through that hole, and I will love her forever. And I so wanted that love of, I'm going to get all cry, cry now, <gasps> um, <laughs> to work. Mm? But you still speak. Yeah. I loved her. <laughs> Maybe someone can kill me later, but I still love her. <laughs> she's my kombi, she's my life, not just my love. We, we, we meet us in the prison in that very bad situation where the, we are uh, a completely uh, lost in the prison. Yes. And we find uh, the rest for ourselves. Uh, we, we spoke too much about uh, our dreams, about our future about in the prison. After we start to do our life, our life is very hard too because we, I stay wanted. When I'm free from the prison, I stay wanted. And my name, you know, I have no paper. She protects me to, uh, like, a Syrian family. She is Syrian, she has a paper too. Oh, because, of course, you're Pal Palestinian. I am Palestinian. Yeah. I have no paper. I born in Jerusalem. Nobody gave me paper. The first paper I have it is French. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're f there's a freedom in this. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> They talk on FaceTime, it's quite, uh, this week they've been having these little m morning chats, actually about the film, because the film is taking off. She's been taken over to the BBC and doing this interview, and he's doing that interview, and so they kind of have this little morning chat uh, on FaceTime, and it's very, it's very And they're pleased very with touching. the product. The, the yeah, I think it's a continuation of their work, really. It's, 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 it's putting the, it's, it's, talking to the people about this, about what they really care about, the country they care about, and uh, their politics. But I, th you know, I, I think that they're not lovers, but they are still comrades, yes, clearly yes. still comrades. Uh, comrades soulmates, in love. Soulmates, maybe. Um, tell the audience what's happening to the film, which is brilliant news. It's going to be... Well, um, there was a, the, 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 apart from all of the cinema stuff, there's a, the most remarkable thing for me, because I mean, I kind of p tactically made it humanistic with... Bur burying the political, I always try to do that because my target audience is three mates up in Hull that don't give a monkeys about wherever I go. <laughs> but they always think, how's Nick, Andy and whoever going to think about wherever I am? Um, and try to get them into that space. Um, and um, usually it doesn't really matter, it still goes out to 265 people on BBC Four. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and after putting your life in it and getting shot at or wherever in the middle of a revolution in Yemen, you think, God, what's this all about? <laughs> we're, better, we're better off in that pea factory in Hull that I never should have never left. <laughs> but um, on this occasion, it seems to have worked because um, we delivered it to BBC Four, and then all the, we won this thing at Sheffield, and then it's done this cinema thing and gone. Uh, the BFI have been more more happy than ever, it's sort of, uh, partly to do the timing. You deliver a good film and there's unfortunately a dead body of a boy swept up on a beach and those things, because when we met that was the thing that you see, it's a kind of shocking pornographic image, but Yasmin said it's necessary, because I was kind of ambivalent about it, you know, but it's necessary. And when those things meet, it kind of helps catapult something. So Charlotte Moore, who's a controller of BBC One, she used to be the head of docs. She remembered me going off to Damascus five years ago and thought I was fucking nuts. Uh, and watched the film and called me up and she said, I've got to utterly respect everything you've done. And as the controller of BBC One, I'm going to put this film out after the 10 o'clock news on BBC One. So that's really, you know, done it for me. I just ask one or two very short questions, then we'll open it. Um, or the 29th after um, after the 10 o'clock news. It's no longer Storyville. It's going to go on Storyville. They still have to honour it. So it's going to go to the 265 viewers the night before <laughs> on BBC The discerning Four. ones. Yeah, okay. there's, yeah. It's going to have a bit more commentary. So I, if you want to, I'd be on the, you, you should be 266 <laughs> if you want to watch the better version. Um, the, the, the boys in, in the film are really central to, to um, 
this story in the extraordinarily different ways that they've responded to what's going on in the country, in their own lives, uh, to this movement that they you know, have to move from place to place. Um, how different they are was also uh, really interesting to me that the oldest one you know, just wasn't that kind of politicized and, and all this. But the youngest one, Bob, is the one, of course, that is, for me, as important a child as the child that I wrote about who washed up on the beach. Everything changed when I started watching him. Um, I don't know if you felt that, that there was such innocence and yet such knowing. He knew everything, didn't he? At a really young age, at three, age of three, he was asking these questions. He, how, how have they adapted to France? Do they still remember all of this? Like what Kaka said, uh, Bob like Mukhabarat, he knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> he knows everything, but he don't want to speak about. But uh, I hope he can forget what happened uh, with us in Beirut or in Damascus, because uh, the, it was very hard time. Now he's in uh, France, like what he promised. I am not Arabic, I'm not English, I'm French. <laughs> and he continued to be French. Uh, actually, he forget his Arabic now. He cannot speak Arabic anymore. He cannot speak just French. But uh, he continued very happy, and, uh, very great and smart uh, boy. And the other two? Uh, he's 18. He's a man now. And, uh, he's in uh, high school. He's very good. He, uh, he's a French rapper. He's good. He continues his life. Uh, I think uh, the memory is still memory. And, uh, I think Bob will be a novelist one day. <laughs> I think he will write a novel one day. Um, and what next? Are you going to do a follow-up? What, what, what's going to happen to, to the story <laughs> that we're now gripped with, Sean? We, I don't know. we want to know. We got drunk last night and we started talking about fictionalizing it and having Angelina Jolie and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, it seemed to me, the way it felt to me as I was watching the film, I said this to my daughter, I was picking her up today from the station, I said, it felt to me like I was watching a feature film directed by some, you know, Hollywood director. Because the personalities are so strong, the, uh, it, you couldn't better it, so don't try. Just really? carry on with oh this. Really? Uh -uh, you couldn't better this, in my view. Let's throw it open. I'll take three questions, or if you have just a statement to make, please um, don't make it too long. Um, <laughs> but if you want to share your feelings, your thoughts, and ask questions, I'll take three at a time. Yeah? Please wait for the microphone oh, to sorry, come to you. Sorry, yes. Uh, can I ask, uh, Sean, uh, to be a, uh, a bit more, um, um, describe a bit more the nature of this encounter with the Mukhabarat, and what happened then, because uh, there's a short reference in the film to that, especially when uh, we, we, we find out that it's because of uh, your arrest that, and the film you had that the family had to move to Lebanon. But then what happened to the film? Did they give it back to you? No. Oh, so. They took it. That's why they had to flee. Yes, but what, so what we're seeing is a different film from what you were shooting there. There was only one clip that we took of one guy being beaten, which uh, I didn't shoot. I see, okay. So what did what? they confiscate? They just confiscated that shoot, I can't remember. Well, then, okay. But if you film over five years, you know, okay. one shooting and, and, and trip. They, they let you out because of pressure from embassy or, or something? Or yeah, what? and also, you know, the, that weird thing of, because you've you got a British passport, they, w they wouldn't touch you. But it, you know, it was still probably more, it was more traumatic than, you know, see, it, f filming death or people being killed. It, it was more traumatic seeing them being hearing whipped them. and hung upside down, having their feet beaten and then electrocuted any 24 hours a day in windowless Any other hands dungeons. up? We'll take that one and then one other. There's a lady on the same row on the other side. Hi, it's a, a question for Amma. Um, you say you're, are you still working with uh, refugees in, in France? And 
are you still in touch with people in Syria who are trying to c carry on the values of the revolution dis despite all the destruction and devastation we, we're seeing and, and that's driving so many people to flee? And we'll take another question and then we'll get the answers. The lady there, please. Um, also a question to Anna. Um, there's obviously a, a, there's a deep sense of isolation when you arrive in France and, and you talked about um, people not being able to understand and, and relate to your experience. Which So how would you, uh, with the hundreds of thousands of people actually arriving in Europe now, how would you recommend that these people are d integrated or welcomed to the various countries to, to you know, where they uh, apply for refugee status? Okay, so the uh, first question, Amma, if you would. I start to, uh, with uh, some friends to uh, do an association. It's uh, called ADABS, A-D-A-B-S. Uh, we take care about refugee, it's our status. And uh, we help the people in Syria, in Lebanon, in Turkish, in uh, Jordan. And uh, sometimes we find a chance to send them a uh, visa. Invitation. They can become later to France. In France, we help the people to find the places for them because one or two months uh, they are outside the government control. Uh, nobody can help them. For that, we take care to uh, let them in this step after they have uh, support from uh, the government. And uh, yes, every day I have contact with my friend in Damascus, in Aleppo, and uh, everywhere in Syria. And uh, I know more than uh, the media uh, say. And uh, don't believe the news. It's worse than that. Worse. I, I cannot understand your question because it you was, use you know, what English. can people do in Europe when so many people are coming from Syria with all this wounds and pain and uh, dislocation? What can good people in Europe do? to help them settle and integrate and, and belong? I, I think there is uh, different ideas I had from one month to now. There is some uh, European groups, they want to uh, go to the border uh, near Hungary, near uh, Turkish or something, uh, to be with refugees. Uh, because they are European, they are protected. Uh, nobody can touch them, nobody can beat them. After, if they ask their government uh, to help these people to find uh, places for, uh, I, I, I say that before, it's not, uh, it's not easy for 8 million uh, Syrian refugees. It's not easy. But I think we can find a way to press our government somehow in Europe or uh, to, to speak with the, uh, to, to do, like uh, to organize uh, travel, travel between Europe and the places of refugee. And there is many ways to help with the food, with the clothes, with the medicine, with money sometimes, to let them safe, to, to let them alive. But how do you help with the uh, emptiness of the heart, uh, when you, the feelings? You know, you can have food, you can have a bed, but some of the things that were in the film that you realized, how can we reach that? How can we fill that space? How can we, Sean? Oh God, I don't know. I think hard, I think it? I think it's quite hard because, as I said, there's a very few people that really kind of can relate to those <coughs> so the psycho psychology of where people have, uh, are at. Um, I don't know. We went to some of the camps on the in Bulgaria and places on the border. It was just horrendous. I mean, it was so bad that that the refugees that had got there, having been beaten up by the Bulgarian police were trying to get back to Syria because at oh. least in Syria they were they knew what was going on but they were just totally lost it also wasn't the fault of the Bulgarian really I mean it was just th and the same with this, this Dublin Treaty thing you know it's just a real mess there just needs to be a concerted effort from Brussels or sort of wherever to, to make to make this passage safe or to open up but ultimately of course the big question I think needs addressing is the is the balance of wealth. If you, one half of the world is extremely wealthy and the other is completely poor, 
this is going to happen, really. You, can you say, Sean, whether intervention, military inter intervention at any stage would have helped prevent some of this? I don't know, because it, I think the military intervention should have happened, but I don't know what the, the, the results of that would have been. Uh, so in hindsight, it's easy to say that, but we don't know what the, what, what the results of that would, be, would, would have been. Well, they've not been very good in Libya or Iraq. It's very difficult, this one, isn't it? Uh, part of you wants intervention, well, and part of you thinks, what if it's a bigger mess? At a mobilizing. How could it be a bigger mess? Huh? How could it be a bigger mess? I know. Well, maybe, or at least, at least having a concerted effort to, to support the Free Syrian Army, believe in them. Uh, I don't know. It, but, uh, but I know that the Syrian people feel completely let down. It, it, I don't know. Any other questions about the love story, perhaps, as well as the politics? The lady there. Thank you. Um, a fantastic film, by the way. Just so absorbing. <laughs> you can hardly believe, you know, what, what I was seeing and the intimacy of it. But this is actually a very practical question, not so much about the love story, but about just the practicalities of supporting a family which is uh, dislocated. You know, when you had to abandon your home and you had to go everywhere, how did you actually support yourselves? You know, ha ha where did the, the wherewithal come from to provide food <laughs> and to live and clothing and so on? How, how do you do that when you have to leave everything behind? I think, can I answer that? Because I think what we don't really realize is how many people live like this. I think he moved houses about 16 times in the making of this film. And there was times I knew he didn't have anything. He couldn't even, fit it, that they'd not, they'd not eaten for days. And that's not unusual for a lot of people in his situation. And that's, I think, what we don't realize. Well, I, I don't know. It's just... I think it's very hard when you live... That, and that question, away. you see, they don't... The, the, Amma wouldn't even think about... They would just think about surviving. They wouldn't think about, well, how did we do all of that? It was all about, well, that's, that's how it is. That's just how it is. But did the, gov did the French government give them some... Eventually in France. I'm talking about before France. No, no, I think this was uh, also about the movement, wasn't it? I, I support all my family, even Dagda, I support her now, she's in Turkey. And uh, I'm with her, she's my friend and my comrade, you know. My kids is very safe, in a very great way. Uh, they are happy, they do their life very well. Uh, how I support myself? I training my face to smile every day. It's <laughs> a good answer. I, he, had, he had his first English breakfast this morning. That, <laughs> that didn't make him smile. It drove him right outside the hotel for a cigarette and a, and a, and a yeah. coffee. I took a photograph of the, the remains of it. It's like a, a piece of art, like a Banksy piece of art. <laughs> Any other? Um, yeah, one here and then. Yes, uh, um, Amir, you keep re referring to yourself and Raghda's comrades, but we don't know a lot about you being comrades in, in what particular organization? And why were you in prison to begin with? This was before the uprising, is that correct? You were in prison before, before the 2011 uprising. Uh, uh, could you give us a little bit of background to why you were in prison? Did you know each other as comrades before you were in prison? Or did you meet while you were in prison? I think you speak Sorry. Arabic. Kate, you're not a spy, are you here? You're not a spy. <laughs> Promise me you're not spying for them. You speak them. Arabic. <laughs> I think you speak Arabic. Do you want to answer in Arabic? Can you ask me again in Arabic? Because the English is... Uh, 
انا ناشط فلسطيني انا بمنظمه التحرير الفلسطينيه رغدة كانت ناشطة بحزب العمل الشيعي السوري المحظور حزب العمل الذي السريان كنا في السجن في عام 92 ل 95 They were in prison in 92 sorry prison in 1992 because of belonging to this left wing party وكان التعارف بيني وبينها بهذا بهذه الفتره بهذا المعتقل يعني اما انني رفقاء كنت مجموعه من الرفقاء لا لا يعني لا لا ما كنت بعرفها ابدا اه اوكي اني اذر كويستشنز فروم ذا اودينس اي ام سربرايز يو هافنت اسكت اباوت ذا ليتل بوي سمبدي وود هاف اسكت اباوت ذا ليتل بوي ذا ليدي ذير اند ذن ذيرز ا كويستشن ات ذا اند اوف ذا روم سوري يا وي كان وي كان دو ات ذا اذر واي اراوند <laughs> yeah, it's to um, Ahmed. Um, I come from Lebanon as well. I mean, not part of the world. And um, I see how they treat the Syrians when they come to, I mean, Syrian refugees. And I know that a lot of them, um, women especially, they turn to like prostitution and um, I mean, pretty harsh things like. Uh, um, burglary and uh, crime and stuff just so that they can get some money um what like what was your experience in Lebanon was it similar to that okay and the other question was the young lady yeah yeah maybe you should M maybe let let's have it in Arabic and then we'll have you so uh أم شوف إنه سمع بشوف إنه كيف السوريين مش ما أم إيه ما ما كتير منيحة إنه على الطريق وما عند المصاري وكتير من ال بنات إنه بيصيروا أم prostitution what's that سؤال سؤال بس إنه what I don't What was your experience with that? Like, did you? شو تجربتي ب بموضوع السوريين بلبنان؟ إيه إنه كيف كيف اللبنانيين ت تصرفوا معك؟ بس بدي I I speak English now. 2006 there is a war in Lebanon. Israeli forces shoot Lebanon for Hezbollah. They fight, and I think. Hundred thousands Lebanese people come to Damascus to Syria. I I was one of the people who go to the border to receive the Lebanese when we take them to Damascus. The houses, uh, clothes, uh, food, money, everything. We support everything. Uh, the opposite when the Syrian start to go to Lebanon. I'm one of them. Uh, many times, some Lebanese people want to beat me in the street just because my accent is the uh, Syrian when I speak Arabic. They want to beat me in the street. I, I try to find a job to, to, uh, to have uh, food for me and my kids. Nobody can accept. Never. They kick me all the time. Uh, plus, plus, Hezbollah want to kill me because I'm against the regime. Uh, I think the, the, the situation is worse now because there is uh, two million, I think, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. It's worse. When, uh, when I was uh, in Lebanon, it's uh, not too much people uh, this time. It's hard. It's hard. Shall we? W can we just have this last lady, just next to you? There? <laughs> So and then we'll, not, we'll, uh, we'll it's uh, it's close. Like uh, I just, uh, it's more a practical question for Sean, because you mentioned that uh, you couldn't get funding for five years. You're a very established filmmaker, hi. Um, and Syria has been a hot topic for a few years. Um, what was the reason? What, what were they 
saying to you when you presented film and tried to get this funding, and, and it, it was an interesting story from the beginning, even if it wasn't a love story. Um, and uh, it's a good thing that they refused you because then it became this more than it would be. But uh, um, I guess my question is, what was the sort of reasoning behind that? Why couldn't you get the funding? I mean, quite simply at the beginning, that no one knew where Syria was, and they didn't. I mean, that was, was the answer. And they were directing me to Libya because at least Libya had Gaddafi, and, and that, that was kind of something sexy or something. And then, um, to be honest, I did get a commission in Syria, but it wasn't, it wasn't AMA, it was something else. And by the time I got there, I, I was so sort of broke and got the money in the bank. Um, I, I, I just, you know, couldn't tell them that, that the project had fallen through. So I kind of kept it going, um, believe, l letting them believe I was in Syria, but I'd actually left to Yemen, where I'd found another character and a revolution was kicking off. And so I delivered my Syria commission, which had taken two years to finally get them to do, uh, as a Yemen film. Um, <laughs> which didn't answer the question on the, man on the exam paper. Clean. No, they were happy. Never they did. took it. They happy, and, and you know that I broke my contract, but they were very grateful of that. But the problem after that was okay, and then the whole thing started kicking off in in Yemen, so I, uh, in Syria. So I said, I've got to go back and do this. They said, No, we've had an Arab film. We don't want another. So they said, What about Greece? I said, Okay, let's do Greece. So they said they gave me some money to go to Greece, and just like I said at the beginning, when they gave me this money to go to Dubai. I sort of flew to Greece with the genuine intention of making a film in Greece, but it wasn't sort of happening. So I was then starting to take secret trips from Greece to Beirut and filming this thing. They continued. And then eventually they kind of cottoned on to what I was up to and they just said, oh, for God's sake, let's just commission this. He's not going to leave it alone, is he? <laughs> Um, and that's, you know, and I think eventually, I think you have to teach them, because actually my, my philosophy with commissioning editors, they don't know what they want, they're like children, and you have to tell them what they want. <laughs> uh, Did you go alone? Where? To, where? Every, I go on my own everywhere. Alone with the oh, everywhere, everywhere, yeah. Well, we have to end this, sadly, but um, it's been, well, thank you both for thank the you. amazing, incredible life-changing film and thank you to the audience for coming to see it and for being so engaged mm -hmm. and you know I hope it changes it will change people I know it will it'll change the EastEnders viewers on BBC One won't it <laughs> it will they'll it never will. watch EastEnders in the same way again Thank you all so much for being here and thank you Yasmin for moderating you, our Yasmin. discussion tonight just one quick note Before we uh, run off, I'm sure you've seen the Film London evaluation papers on your seats. So if, if you can borrow a pen from your neighbor and take the time to fill them out, they helped make the event possible and helped Amir to be here tonight with us all. So if you're able to fill them out and just leave them on the chair in the back, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Sure, let me just, um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, sure. I just want to text my husband to ask him to pick me up because I don't go on trains at night. I don't like them. Oh, come on, come on. Yeah.